Um, so I, I've, I've started the DEF CON Group Title Four chapter in New Orleans, and I'm friends with the guys that started the DEF CON Group 225 out in Baton Rouge. And I think a lot of them, I think they might even meet a lot of times. Um, but yeah, yeah should definitely check it out. Nice. Yeah. So we're done with chapter two now. So we're going to move on to chapter three. And so here, I'd like to try to get through. Well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what uh, pacing we go through. But chapter three is going to continue this more bottom level exploration upward. So recall in the last chapter, we really focused in on how is our information, how is our data stored on the machine. So the next thing that we're going to be investigating in chapter three is going to be machine level representation of our programs. Okay, so let's first cover some of the learning objectives that we'd like to get by the time we conclude this chapter. We're going to learn how to read x86-64 machine code generated by a C compiler. We're going to cover the basic instruction patterns generated for different control constructs, such as our conditionals, our loops, and our switch statements. We're gonna cover the implementation of procedures, including stack allocation, register usage conventions, and parameter passing. We're gonna cover the way different data structures, such as uh, structs, uh, unions, and arrays are allocated and accessed. We'll cover the instructions that implement both integer and floating point uh, arithmetic inside of our system. And then we're going to use the machine level view of programs as a way to understand common code security, uh, security uh, vulnerabilities, such as buffer overflow and steps that you as the developer, the compiler and the OS can try to take to reduce those threats. Okay, so again, the motivation behind why you want to learn these things is it's going to make you a better program. Right, And because you'll understand how programs are represented on our machine, you'll also be able to have a deeper understanding of how pointers work to go ahead and access uh, elements in uh, memory. So a quick uh, breakdown based off of how the textbook goes ahead and defines this material is going to be as such we're going to walk through these slides following along the textbook because this is supposed to be a one-to-one -one correspondence in my, my view. If you read the textbook, if you do the slides, you should be getting double coverage on these concepts. So we're gonna start with the historical perspective. We're gonna to move to uh, the program encodings and then we're gonna examine data formats. We'll talk about accessing information. And some of these concepts we have seen in the uh, preliminary PDFs that we saw on our uh, inside of our essential C, some of these concepts were kind of clued in there. Uh, then we'll move on to arithmetic and logic operations. We'll talk about control, procedures, array allocation and access, uh, heterogeneous data structures, and then combining control and data in machine level programs. And then finally, we'll leave off on the floating point code. And then to conclude everything, there'll be the summary. Okay, so before we actually start with our historical context, let's just go through the preface of what we should know before we delve deeper into these concepts. So first, let's talk about what is machine code. And so, as we stated, I think earlier in the semester, we could define it as uh, an encoded byte sequence that represents low-level CPU operations. So the key functions of our machine code would be for data manipulation, it would be for memory management, it'd be for our input-output operations, and be for our network communications. So of course, the role of our compiler is to translate our high-level code to our machine code. It operates in stages, as we already saw in the first lab. Um, and it considers our programming language rules and the machine instruction set, right? So it's like a one-to-one -one correspondence where it's interfacing between those two mechanisms, us and the machine it's going to execute on. And then finally, there's going to be some operating system conventions that the compiler has to abide by. OK, so in particular, as we've stated previously, GCC is the compiler that we'll be using. 
So we'll just take a look and do a quick overview on the compilation process, just to make sure everyone's on the same page here. So our GCC outputs assembly code, which is a human readable version of machine code. And so when I say human readable, recall that when you were writing assembly code, and we'll look at this more in the slides, there is a syntax and a set of reserved words that you can parse and understand, as opposed to the binary encoding, which is just a set of hexadecimal values, which ultimately that gets assembled into. So that's what I mean by human readable. It's human readable, but not as readable, I would argue, as maybe a higher level code, like C code. And then one would argue that's not as human readable as an even higher level code, such as maybe Python. Okay, so anyway, we go from assembly to executable. Uh, the GCC uses an assembler to convert our assembly code to the machine code, which is gonna be that hexadecimal representation that we saw. And we'll see another slide of that just as an example. And then finally, a linker is used to generate the executable. These are all things that we saw in the lab. Now, what we're gonna get in this chapter though is a much thorough exploration of the machine and the assembly code representations. Okay, so we have high level and we have assembly code. So clearly we've defined high level code as an abstraction from our machine level details in languages like C and Java. And so our assembly code directly writes that low level instructions. Uh, so at, at, at some point, that's how you code it, <laughs> was, was at the assembler level. Like, in fact, one of the, one of the astounding things, at least to me, is on the earlier versions of video games, things like Zelda, the first Zelda, the first Mario, all those old, old games were written in assembly, not in a higher level language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I guess it's Zelda. Yeah, I want to say probably Game, uh, game Boy, too. Uh, so it, it's, in fact, if you ever do a decomposition on some of those early games, it's astounding to me how optimized they did <laughs> down to level design. So basically all 80s games like, were created from assembly? Yeah. Yeah. So we have it much better. In <laughs> what about 90s games? 90s games created from assembly? Well, some of them, yeah, some that's them. where you start getting a mix of tooling introduced in. And it depends on who the uh, the manufacturer was. Ah, um, what would those type of install assembly? And then others would use bits of assembly to optimize certain parts. And of course, now, clearly, when we talk about this, the advantages of high level is the fact that uh, it's portable, it's easier for us to author, Right, uh, it can be more efficient for us to develop inside that space. It gives us better error detection uh, tooling. And we can actually have, uh, the, with current compilers, they can optimize probably far better than you can if you were to try to hand optimize. Yeah, yeah. Again, all of these concepts were already in the lab. So, on those optimizers, like what are the chances that it trash code? Not likely. I, I mean, like if you go, you know, zero over three. Uh huh. Yeah, which we'll, we'll take a look at. And in fact, this would be a good semester to, to play around with that. See yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, so why do you want to learn machine code, right? Because we have high level code options now. In fact, it's hard enough to get people to learn C or C++ or Java because they want to do Python. So like trying to get people to do machine code is like going to be twofold harder, tenfold harder than that. Well, there's a, a couple of reasons why we should spend some time last semester doing this and a couple of lectures this semester kind of delving into this again. Uh, the significance here is that there are essential skills that serious programmers, such as yourselves, right, would like to know, despite your our compiler advancements that does this for us, we should understand what the compiler is doing. 
we should understand that there's not a magic layer that translates our high level code and makes it do things in the system. Right? We should understand what the system's doing to put our code into action. And so the reason why we wanna know this is it'll allow us to better understand the optimization principles that the compilers are putting forth and help identify code efficiencies. It could also help us identify or better understand runtime behaviors. So this gives us insight in how concurrency works. It can give us a better idea of how to optimize or how optimization works and also vulnerabilities that could happen at the machine code level that you would be unaware of without understanding how those technologies work. And then finally, there's gonna be a, a bit of a transition where we're gonna shift from like writing and reading assembly, which is what you did last class to more uh, lean into understanding the compiler generated code because that's actually what's happening, right? And we kind of want to compare and contrast those two human authored assembly versus compiler authored or auto generated assembly. Which is exactly what's covered on this next slide. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we want to understand how we can take our high level C language and translate that into assembly or how we might take assembly and translate that, retranslate that back into C, which if I'm not mistaken, is that kind of how you finished off in your assembly class? Is that? Translating back to C. Yeah, like doing translations between C and assembly and assembly there, and C. There were some examples here that but not as much as Okay, that's at least you've seen the how how you can how those two kind of correlate them. Well, we'll look deeper into that over the, the course of this chapter. And of course, these concepts are going to be very relevant towards reverse engineering techniques. So here we can compare and contrast source code with assembly output, right? So what we'll do is we'll we'll take some code, we'll go ahead and compile it, and then we can uh, we can use a disassembler to then look at what we have and try to rebuild our, our C code from that, right? And then you could try to see, you could try to start to build up an understanding of how that works. And once you understand how your C code gets compiled into executable code, then you can start to learn how to read executable code back into C code. And you do that by starting to identify patterns and deducing uh, the compiler made decisions when it auto generates that assembly code. Okay, so let's talk about the machine language that we're going to be using inside of this class. It's going to be x86-64. It's the current dominant uh, version uh, because it's used in a lot of powerful uh, modern devices and servers, which, you know, probably where we're going to be living in our system levels lives. Uh, a, a quick note on the evolutionary journey, and we'll actually talk about this in 3.1. It began with Intel 16-bit processor all the way back in 1978, and it's expanded all the way to be 64-bit, and there's an evolution there. Evolution means that like the prior states are still kind of relevant in the current state. And so here, our modern interpretation is really going to be to examine it in reference to GCC and to Linux, right? And so inside of our systems lab uh, terminal that you have, that's the workspace that we're, we're utilizing. Okay, quick note on the technical topics we're going to cover over the course of this chapter. Uh, obviously, we're going to do, uh, we're going to understand the relationship between C and assembly because we're trying to build up from the bare, bare bones to our system level applications. We're gonna dive into x86-64 and unpack some of the data representations. We're gonna implement some control constructs, procedures and data structures. So we're gonna kind of get our hands dirty a little bit in assembly. Uh, we'll look at some of the runtime considerations in terms of uh, memory referencing and addressing buffer overflow of vulnerabilities. And we're also gonna look at how to use debugger and also uh, with with uh, with GDB, so a systems level debugger, which we already talked about at least nominally, topically inside of the Unix toolkit uh, 
uh, slides that we looked at. And then finally, we'll talk about handling floating points. Uh, look at the machine level representation of that a little bit more so, which we've kind of talked about at least conceptually last chapter. Okay, let's move to 3.1. So a historical perspective, let's just jump right into it. So as we said earlier, uh, it was the Intel processor, the x86, you probably saw in the naming of every fix, uh, x86-64 is what we're, we're gonna call it. Let's, let's, let's examine why it's called x86. So it comes from the 16-bit microprocessor that had a, that was developed by Intel. Let's see if we can't look at some of the key features from the beginning to current day that's listed for us. So back in 78, there was the 8086, which was our 16-bit microprocessor. And this was the basis by which we start. And so a lot of the concepts that drives how we manage data, how we package data, the bit vector sizes, the word sizes of everything is based off of this initial specification. And everything derives using this basis. So then in 82, you had the 286. Okay, I'm gonna start mixing the 80 in front. And so, and th I think this was just some, if you actually kind of grew up with this technology, you were just calling them 286s, 386s, 486s, all the way until you had the uh, the Pinium series that finally launched. So uh, after the 8086, which was a, uh, some of these are a little bit before my time. <laughs> but I know that <laughs> conceptually. <laughs> I think my first computer that I had was a, uh, was a 486. But uh, with the 286, we uh, we had some more addressing modes with the 386. They expanded to be 32 bit as opposed to 16 bit. So Mazen 32, I think, is what you were what you were doing inside of the last uh, assembly class. 46 integrated floating point units, which was a big deal. Then you started to have the Pinium uh, line that came out, and that just offered a whole new set of instructions. It was a massive update in that time. And that was, that was a really exciting time during uh, home computers because it seemed like every six months your processing speed was doubled. It was, it, and then uh, since 2006, you have your core series, which is now multi-core processors that allow for hyper-threading and a lot, of, a lot of cool new advancements that we can all take advantage of. And we're gonna try to motivate the importance of throughout this class. Oh yeah, it was technology like doubles every three years. Yeah, that was uh, uh, was it Yeah, Moore's Law. That's right. Yeah, everything feels like it. Mm-hmm. No, there was a time where that was it was pretty consistent. Okay, so in terms of the fact that we're looking at 86, again, the key concept of this is backward compatibility, right? So each new processor can run code from the earlier version. And of course, we also have AMD. AMD is the major competitor to Intel. They initially lagged behind Intel for a number of years, like only the cheap computers would be AMD. Until, yeah, until they finally caught up. Like, yeah, I, and uh, actually they were the ones who introduced the x86-64 bit architecture, which then got adopted by Intel. They were the first to one That's also true, yeah. They were the first to uh, surpass uh, one gigahertz. So it illustrates, yeah, that competition resulted in, yeah, I mean, those were the <laughs> in some advantages. And so again, let's just go ahead and state some terminology here after just doing a quick historical perspective. So whenever we, you see IA32, that's indicative to, of Intel's 32-bit architecture. Whenever you see Intel 64, that's Intel's branding of their 64-bit extension to IA32. And then, 
x86-64 is going to be the 64-bit extension to the x86 architecture, which Intel itself had adopted. And again, whenever we see x86, where that originated was all the way back with that 8086 lineage and kind of stepped through all the way until even having its impacts today. Those that leading number, yes. Yeah, so, so you had 8086 and then you had 8286. Then, then they went with the, the I prefix on that. And they, for some reason, just dropped the, the 80. Yeah. But you still went down three. Yeah, that's right. And then they just went to the opinion mod, but they still use the x86 um, um, architecture uh, instruction set. That was backwards compatible at least. So then they built on new instructions, but they made sure they were backwards compliant. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Oh, really? Um, okay, let's talk about 3.2. Let's go to our programming codings. So let's jump right to it. So the purpose of comp uh, compilation, as we stated earlier, is to transform our human readable code into machine executable instructions. We can combine multiple code files into one unified executable. We've seen this in the first lab. So when we write our C programs, we can split our projects across multiple C uh, source code files. And then we can use GCC to go ahead and compile those into our executable uh, uh, file into our, our object kit. And so recall that when we through the, go through this GCC compilation process, there's our selection of a compiler, there's your uh, compilation commands that you can go ahead and send to your compiler. And so just an example, and this is the example pulled directly from the book, is uh, specifying your optimization level, obviously invoking the compiler from the, the command line from the terminal, and then being able to uh, define what the output name is gonna be for your executable, and then the series of C files that it's gonna use to build into that executable. Yep, and so here, this we should be familiar with. Everyone's already kind of authored and compiled some C code and has done a very deep investigation into that the GCC uh, staging. So let's go through this. So here we were talking about the optimization levels just a moment ago, uh, where at your um, your default value, if you don't uh, if you don't toggle it, would be at effectively your uh, OG, and then you have O1, O2, and however, which will get more and more aggressive at optimization. And of course, you want to choose your optimization level based off of how much debugging you need versus how much performance you need. The more optimized it is, the more difficult it might be to debug the code later. Okay, and of course, our compilation process, just quickly stepping through this, has the, uh, the it has your C processor, your compiler side, uh, stage, your assembler stage, and your linker stage. And of course, we already know the C processor goes ahead and that prepares our source code for compilation. And it's going to pre-process. We're going to get our pre-processed source code back out on that. And then we have our compiler stage, which is going to translate our source code to assembly code. And so that's going to be those assembly code files that are then appended with a .s extension. Then we go to that assembler stage that converts our assembly code to binary code. And so that's going to output our object code files which we can see has the extension of .o. And then we have our linker stage, which is going to combine our multiple object files and libraries. And that's going to finally output our executable file, which would be just whatever that whatever our output name is that we send to our GCC compiler that we can then execute from our command line. So now we actually have a program or an application. 
Okay, so there's two types of machine code, right? There's object code and there's executable code. Our object code is the intermediate representation in binary format. So the characteristics, it contains our machine level instructions. It lacks defined addresses for global values. And it's produced for each source code uh, file or source file during our compilation. And so it, 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 the purpose of it is it aids in our modular development inside the separate compilation process that we go through. Now the executable code to kind of contrast from that is gonna be our binary code that's actually ready to execute. Okay. So here our characteristics is now that all the symbols and addresses are resolved. It's combined with all the necessary libraries and it's directly interpreted by the processor. So here the process here is, it's generated by the linker and it merges all of our multiple object files and libraries and reserves, whatever it needs to in terms of even memory address. So in terms of our machine level code, let's go to our subsection inside of 3.2 into 3.2.1, that's this machine level code. So let's talk about abstraction and machine level code. We've already kind of discussed this uh, at least a little bit previously, we have our ISA, which is our instruction set architecture, and we have our virtual addresses. So we already kind of, I think it was in chapter one where we kind of, when we did a tour of a computer system, we talked about this. So again, our instruction set architecture simply just defines our processor state, our instruction formats, and the effects on the state. And again, our ISA assumes a sequential operation. Even if our hardware can execute concurrently, we still have to ensure a sequential behavior. And then again, the other abstraction that we take advantage of is our virtual addresses. And again, our machine level programs use these addresses to provide a model of our memory as if it were just a vast byte of arrays. When actuality, is all these individual constituent uh, modules, hardware modules. And again, the advantage of abstraction allows us to simplify our memory addressing and management. Okay, so let's talk about assembly versus machine code. Our assembly code is a textual representation. So it's closer to be, it's, it's something we can, we can understand and parse, whereas our machine code, um, it exposes parts of our processor state hidden C, such as our program counter, right? Which we can call uh, our uh, RIP for our x86-64. We'll take a look at some of the um, some of the registers that are available inside of the assembly that we'll look at. Okay, so when I say processor state and our memory model. What I mean by our processor state is going to be those individual components that you probably examined somewhat in assembly. So you have your program counter, which indicates the next instruction address. You're going to have your integer register file, which contains 16 name locations storing 64 pit values. You're going to have your condition code registers, which holds your status information from recent operations. And then finally, your vector registers, which can store multiple integer floating point values. Right. So same concept of what your tools were in assembly is going to be relatively similar to what we're looking at here. And then finally, our memory in our machine code, we can think of in terms of the view, it's seen as a large byte of addressable array in terms of its representation. It's an aggregate data types like arrays and structures, which are continuous byte collections. Okay, so the execution characteristics and our virtual address space. So our program memory components contain our machine code, our operating system information, our runtime stack, and our user allocated memory blocks. And so our virtual address is used for addressing with only a certain range being valid, just like what we said in chapter one. So in terms of our elementary operations, we have either our machine instructions or compiler role. So our machine instructions perform our simple tasks like addition, data transfer, and conditional branching. And then the role of the compiler is it generates the instruction sequences to implement complex programming 
construct. So at the end of the day, all of the high level programming languages are constrained to what you can do at the assembly level. What's powerful about the high level programming languages we have is that they're super expressive. We can write very minimal code and it can then unpack that to be masses amounts of our um, assembly code or which then gets translated into our machine level code. But everything that gets expressed inside of say for instance C or Java or whatever other language has to also have the ability to build that out as a collection of units defined in our uh, assembly. Okay, let's go to code examples, something where we can actually look and tangibly touch. So let's start by introducing some C code. And I think this is the C code that's pulled directly from the textbook from this chapter. So suppose we have this definition. So here we are going to uh, have uh, our function that we're going to define as mold store, but notice we're gonna go ahead and um, also grab this function is this, no, it's not here. We're gonna go ahead and utilize a function that's predefined that takes in two long data types and it's gonna return back a long data type called mold2. We're, this is not defined inside of the source code given to us, but we're gonna assume that it multiplies two long data types and gives back a long data type. So the purposes of this function, we're gonna define this as being that thing, the being some external function for us that multiplies two numbers together. Okay, so given that, let's define a function. This function does not have a return type, it's void. We're gonna call it mult store. It's gonna take in three parameters. The first parameter is gonna be a long X. The second parameter is going to be a long y, and the third parameter is going to be a pointer to a long that we'll call destination. That's our destination point. So notice, instead of having a return type, the idea is that we're going to compute a value here. So we're going to take x and y, we're going to pass it in to that other function. We're going to get back a result, and then we're going to save that result into a new local variable. Then we're gonna take the value of that local variable and we're gonna bind that, we're gonna store that into the address of where that desk pointer is at, right? So does everyone understand what this C code is doing? If, if for any reason you don't, go ahead and leave a comment in the, uh, in the chat, but I'm gonna move on. Okay, so when we go and generate our assembly code, we can go ahead and do that using GCC as you are already familiar because you did that in the first lab and you even ex inspected what you got back in the first lab. And it probably looks something like this. So you can see our generated assembly file would have a label, mold store. And then it's gonna have a sequence of calls or a sequence of uh, instructions, statements. So our explanation line by line is the first thing we're doing is we're gonna push the current value of our register RBX by pushing it on, uh, we're gonna save the current value of RBX by pushing it onto the stack. Because we don't, we don't know what's there currently, so we don't necessarily wanna override it in case there's some other function or there's some other part of our program that's relying on whatever that value is. So we're gonna, we're gonna save whatever's currently inside of RBX onto our stack. Then the next thing we're gonna do, this move Q on RDX and RBX, we're gonna copy the destination pointer, which is our third argument to the function into RBX. So RDX is where our third argument's gonna be. We're gonna go ahead and copy that into this in our RBX register. Then we're going to make a call to that external function which now has the values it needs in the register space. Then we're going to, that's going to update our registers after that call happens. So then what we can do after that is where we can then move our quad word. So move Q is a quad word. We're gonna move Q our uh, RAX, the value in RAX into RBX. 
So that's going to get us the result that we've computed and then put that into where our destination pointer is at. Then we're going to restore the original value of RBX. So we're going to pop that off the stack. And then we're going to return controller. Uh, we're going to turn, uh, return control to the uh, to our uh, instruction pointer. And so this is probably not too dissimilar to what your assembly code looked like, right, in MASM32. It might be slightly different keywords, but ultimately you can probably parse that and understand what's happening. Is, is that safe to say? Okay, so then the next thing we can do is if we were to generate our object code using this command here with GCC, the result of generating our object code would result in a object file of 1,368 bytes. That seems, seems, I don't know. In fact, I don't, I don't think that's relevant here. What's relevant here is that we, we can't view our object file directly because if we did, it would be just a byte sequence. We can represent it as a hexadecimal sequence. And in fact, if I, if I open that up, I can then retranslate those hexadecimal rep representations back into the more human readable assembly instructions we just looked at. So for instance, we can see this, the 14 hexadecimal byte values that are listed here. Here, I can then break it down into here. Can everyone kind of see this table? It's kind of... Okay, so our 53 would be here. And then the largest grouping of hexadecimal values would be five. So this is effectively all of the instructions just put in linear, in a linear sequence. So the 53 represents that push of RBX. The 4489 D3, this block of hexadecimal values encodes this instruction to move the RDX register into the RBX register. This largest sequence here, the E8000000, is the one that makes a call to that other function that we have defined somewhere in memory. Remember, everything that we're running in our system has to be preloaded in memory. So it has some address, some memory address that it can do a lookup and grab those instructions from. Then the next uh, hexadecimal sequence, 4889 uh, is gonna do that move from our register, our, A, our RAX register into our RBX register. So we've processed the result from the other call. So then we're going to assign that into our destination pointer. Then finally, our 5B is going to do the pop on RBX. And finally, our C3 is going to go ahead and return our, our, our pointer to uh, the next function, the next instruction that has to get executed. So now we could see how we've gone from our C code into our assembly code into effectively our machine code, which would then just be represented as this binary sequence inside of our system. But given the context, we know that this is a program and it gets sent to the processor and then the processor can parse it and actually execute it. Okay, so suppose we wanted to use a dis disassembler. Well, the purpose of a disassembler allows us to convert our machine code into our The purpose of our disassembler is to convert our machine code back into an assembly format. And we can do this by do using a OBJ, short for object, an OBJ dump dash D as the flag and then our object file. 
And if we were to do that, the sample output we would look at would be something along these lines, where each line shows the hexadecimal byte value on the left. So that's the encoding. And each uh, value on the right is now the, uh, the equivalent assembly instruction for that encoding. And so that's how we can disassemble code and start our process of reverse engineering code that's already been compiled. So if, if you ever wondered what that, 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 what that was, that process was, if you haven't seen it already, that's how we're gonna do it. Uh, that, that's how you do it and that's how we are going to do it. Uh, I wanna say that when we go through the next lab, the next lab is probably gonna be bomb lab. If we're starting to investigate debugging, right? I, I got to double check the syllabus, but I'm pretty sure the next lab is going to be our bomb lab. We'll have to use the debugger to effectively see where certain trigger points are happening inside of our code. Okay, so let's take a quick look at some of these uh, assembly naming conventions we have. So, and, and, and again, what I mean by this is how our GCC generated code might be, and then when our disassembler goes ahead and then outputs it. So our GCC generated code might go ahead and do a push queue. And the push queue is short for a quad word. And we'll look at that in just a moment, just to make sure, because I don't think we covered uh, the terminologies, but we're now starting to investigate that. So we'll look at that a little bit deeper. Uh, so in this instance, we would be pushing a quad word into uh, the register uh, RBX, or so we're pushing RBX, the value of RBX onto the SAC. Our disassembler output that would represent that might omit the Q. So it's just showing you, hey, we're gonna push the value of RB, uh, RBX. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes you'll have these slight distinguishable differences between the code that was generated by GCC versus the code that gets disassembled by uh, through through the, the disassembler. Okay, so again, we've already seen this command, but we'll reiterate because it's relevant towards this conversation in order to be able to link and create an executable code. So we looked at how do we take our object code and then make it back into assembly code, right? And we saw the command that does that for us, which was here using uh, obj dump. Now, if I want to take my object code and actually make it an executable, we use our GCC. And then we just, if we want to give it a name, it's dash O, and then you give it whatever name it is, which is super important, because if you don't give it a name, you get a really strange default name. Yeah, a dot out usually. Okay, and then finally, we can also disassemble our executable. So I think in our prior slide, we talked about disassembling an object, an object file, but there's two types of machine code. There's the object files that we can disassemble, and then there's also our executable files that we can send to OBJ dump to also disassemble. So we would do obj dump dash d and then whatever that application file name is. And so here, what we could see is you'll get uh, different addresses due to the linker being involved as opposed to the object file, because remember our application file is fully resolved. You might get uh, the linker fills in functions and call addresses and you might get possible additional instructions for memory optimization. Okay, so some challenges for, some formatting challenges for our assembly code, uh, human readability, right? So assembly code from GCC can be challenging to understand because it's auto-generated. It's not really designed to be read. Doesn't mean you can't read, it's just that's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be a challenge for you as opposed to human crafted assembly code. Uh, you might have unnecessary information that's embedded into it that's designed for the machine itself to go ahead and execute it. Such as, so there might be directives that you might look in there and like, why is that there? 
And then there might be obviously a lack of descriptions, no clear connection between the original source code uh, that's there, or even like a naming of things that's uh, useful or valuable. Okay, so some notes on formatting here. Let's talk about uh, generating assembly from C. So if I go to my GCC, and if I go ahead and pass my, um, uh, my S flag here, to uppercase S with my C code, it'll generate my assembly. And so notice when it generates my assembly that there are these lines that prefix with a dot, those are my assembler linker directives. So those are directives for the GCC pipeline, right? To go ahead and insert uh, uh, various things. So this would be like a file directive and then the name of the file. This would be a text directive and a global multi-store directive for any kind of data that has to be accessible. And this, this is just a, uh, this is a shortened version so I can put it on the slide. Okay, so let's talk about annotated assembly, which we can do, we could produce for clarity when we're trying to parse or reverse engineer some, some assembly code into what it's attempting to do in a higher level language like C. So let's go back to our function here, which is our mult store, where we take in a long X along Y and we take in our destination pointer. So our parameters, when we go and look at the, when we're looking at the assembly code, we can say our X is gonna be in our RDI, our Y is gonna be in our RSI, so our destination, our source, and our DX, um, uh, our, our RDX. So again, if we look at our annotated assembly with that understanding, we can look at this and annotate. And the key to an annotating is that we wanna be clear and we wanna just be relevant for the things that are important. So you might have volumes of, of, um, of calls that are here, but try to keep your annotation for what's occurring. So here, this is us saving our RBX. This is copying our destination to RBX. This is our call to MULT2, and then finally our return. So this is an example of how we might annotate all of our instructions to the left of each of, our, uh, of uh, each of these lines here. Was that output to a particular program, or is that just an example of? Just an example of annotating, yeah. So this is not, this is, this is an output from a human. Oh. But, uh, so just the equivalent to saying you, you should comment while you're going through the process of reverse engineering. Um, I know this uh, comment used uh, optimism on um, uh, file forms. It actually does some interesting stuff. Uh, it, it tells you where print is and all that. Oh, excellent. Yeah, well, we're going to be playing around with more of this in a practical way um, on the tail end, probably, hopefully, maybe next lecture. And if not next lecture, definitely by uh, next Tuesday. I'm, more, I'm really excited to get into some of the, uh, these, um, the uh, get to the point where we can do the shell lab, though. I think that's going to be the biggest and the most epic of challenges for this semester. So, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about our data formats. So now that we've talked a little bit at length about our, uh, our translation and our representation of, of assembly code, our C code into assembly code, it's machine code, which then can be held inside of memory, inside of our system. Let's talk a little bit, and we talked a little bit about the historical perspective of how we got to how we encode or define our assembly level code. Let's talk a little bit about the data formatting that our assembly level code expects and how there's an artifact of its history inside of its definitions. So a quick introduction into our data formats, a little bit of background. We saw that Intel progressed starting at 16-bit, 
moved to 32-bit, and then we're finally in 64-bit. Uh, so that has some consequences in, in word choices, right? So, and very, I guess, uh, I, I didn't mean that as a pun either, <laughs> but it, it worked quite well. Uh, so yeah, whenever we say word, we typically refer to something that is a 16-bit uh, uh, vector or sequence. So a double word would be a 32-bit sequence and a quad word would be a 64-bit sequence. Why? Is this something that's worth mentioning? The fact that we have a word, a double word, and a quad word? Well, that's going to come from the different types of primitive data types that we're going to have and the way that we would then express those data types at the assembly level. So we have bytes, words, double words, uh, and then our floats or doubles are based off of whether it's single or double precision, right? So again, we're thinking about the data types as the addressable space inside of our register. And so our register spaces, and you probably saw this inside of assembly, and this is true uh, inside of MASM32, and this is true uh, in this instance as well, that if we have a register space that can hold up to 64 bits, it's also can be subdivided into a 32-bit register, which itself can be subdivided into a 16-bit register, right? Um, which can be obviously subdivided all the way down until you get to your smallest addressable space, which is gonna be a byte, which can be your eight bits. So that means all the predefined data types that we have in our C declaration would have an Intel data byte equivalent on how much register space it's going to have to allocate. And so the reason why that's worth mentioning is that these key words that we can use to push data or move data at the assembly level can be appended with a letter that represents what part of the register it's going to operate on. And again, I think you probably went over this in assembly, right? Like you probably updated only partial parts or, or like the upper or lower regions of a register. And so that's the same concept here is that uh, it's worth knowing that B is you're moving just a byte's worth of the register space. Uh, if it's append, uh, appended with the W, it would be the word size, 16 bit. Uh, our double word is an L and our Q is our quad word. Okay, let's talk about accessing information. Let's move on to 3.4. Okay, so here, a quick overview of our x86-64 CPU. Uh, our architecture, as we said, is a derivative of the x86 architecture. So that's the instruction set that we're kind of based off of in terms of those uh, inherited properties. But on top of that, there are 16 general purpose registers that we have uh, access to. And so those registers are like what we saw earlier, like RBX, RCX, RAX. Uh, we'll, we actually will look at a table to see all of them. To, so that you can get a uh, just at least an example. And then our usage of our registers, uh, we, we can use it for integer data, right? So it can hold whole numbers for arithmetic and uh, other operations, or we could use it for pointers, for pointer references. Uh, when I say pointers in the systems, I don't mean floating point numbers, I mean uh, pointers to memory addresses. Okay, so like I said earlier, this is, what our register space looks like now. So you can see with a uh, with the more modern x86-64, we get larger addressable registers than what you had in MASM32. That should be quite obvious. But I think there's probably uh, more registers available to you than you had in MASM32 as well. And so here, it's kind of hard to see on probably on the projected slide, but I'll share these with you, you can see, and this is inside your book as well, shows you what each of these particular registers are defaultedly used for. 
because as you might be aware, if you do like a increment, if you if you do the equivalent of some kind of uh, or, or decrement, there's an assigned register that your result would go to. And that's why you always wanna push and pop your values if they're valuable before you potentially mutate or overwrite your register space whenever you're processing operations. I'm not gonna spend too much time kind of going over these by uh, detail because it's not necessary. If you need to know what the registers are, just look it up to see uh, where a value gets defaultedly placed or looked up from. Okay, and of course, as I already stated, our registers have different data sizes. Our registers have different addressable uh, uh, labels or identifiers. So you can either do a byte level operation, you could do a 16-bit operation, a 32-bit operation, or a 64-bit operation. If you do a 64 operation, obviously in x86, 64, that's going to affect the entire register. If you do a 32-bit operation, it's going to do the lower bounds of the least significant bits of that register up to 32 bits. If you do a 16-bit operation, it's going to be the, the least significant of the two of, of the first two bytes. So you start your addressable space at the least significant bit and kind of grow out based off of what that operation is. And again, this should be, I think, very familiar with uh, assembly. It should be in line and step with everything that you've done last semester. Uh, our, uh, in terms of how we might handle different data sizes now, if it's uh, a one or two byte quantity, the remaining bytes would remain unchanged inside of the register. If it's a four byte quantity, a 32 bit uh, uh, operation, then it, the upper four bytes will be zeroed out. And I think that, that that's typically for backwards compatibility for 32 bit operations. Whereas for the uh, byte and the, the one byte and two byte, the 16 bit quantities, uh, you kind of untouch that because that's how it was used in 32 bit operations. So like the evolutionary rules, I think is just trying to emphasize what it means to shift up to 64 bits since your, your most recent knowledge is in 32 bit. Okay, let's talk about the roles of our registers inside of our programs. Let's talk about some of the special roles. They can, so whenever we see RSP, that's the register, that's the, um, that's gonna be our register that is our stack pointer. And of course our stack pointer, the purpose of that indicates the end position of our runtime stack. And so a quick example of what a runtime stack is, is when we call a function, our RSP register is adjusted to make room for the local variables and all the safe registers. Okay, then we have 15 other registers besides our stack point. And so those are generally used for storing any kind of temporary, or, uh, temporary data or function arguments or whatever else, right? Those are more general purpose. Uh, they can be used interchangeably in many instructions. There are some exceptions though, where there are some operations where it requires a particular register to use. And so like you learn that by using those, those, those calls and looking it up, just like you would any other kind. You look at documentation. Look at documentation, it tells you what registers a particular instruction is going to look at and where it's going to deposit the value from. And be aware from that. Okay, in terms of our, weird, I drawn. Okay, so our, in terms of our standard use of our registers, we can think of using them uh, for one of two different purposes, functions and storage, right? So for functions, uh, managing the stack, passing arguments and returning values are the key things we wanna think of so for managing the stacks, our registers, especially RSP, keep track of where the data or the return addresses are pushed onto or popped off of. We need to use our registers for passing arguments. We saw that when we were calling another function inside of our function. 
So here, our convention determines which registers pass the first few arguments into a function. And finally, for returning a value, there are certain registers that hold return values from another function. And again, you can get an idea if you look back at the code that I shared earlier about how we preloaded certain registers and looked them up and said, oh, that's where our parameters are going to be. Oh, we're going to look at this register because that's the return value of the function we just called from within this function is going to be at. And then also for storage. So local data, so our registers are a temporary storage uh, 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 place for where our functions process their results. And also just temporary data. So during our computation, we might compute intermediary results, move them into a register, then move them out before binding them into some memory location. So it actually gets saved after we're done processing this function. Also, when you start looking at our code at this granularity, you see why our variables are just local, like locally scoped, right? Unless we tell the system to save it somewhere else in uh, uh, the memory address, you see it just gets overridden inside the register space. Okay, let's talk about our operand specifiers. So our, uh, let's see, we have, yeah, perfect. Only accruing these blue lines on my system. <laughs> okay, so in that's like probably a something to do with Zoom. Yeah. Are these live right now accessible by the class? Uh I don't think the this set is. I'll probably make I usually make the sets uh available after lecture, but either way. I'll take a look at it, I guess, after, after our lecture. Let's talk about the operand uh, specifiers. So by operand specifiers, I mean inside of our assembly language, when we have an operator, what are the different types it can be? Uh, what are the um, different ways that we can uh, reference memory or address our memory mode or what are the different uh, addressing modes that we have. So here, let's define what it means to be an operand specifier. Uh, we have to specify a source value for an operation and then the destination for the result, right? So the operators that we have inside of assembly are kind of like primitive operators inside of our higher le level languages, right? It's, it has some symbol or key word that represents a certain action that when it's when it's seen by our assembler, it's going to translate into instruction by the processor. So in a high level language, that would be like the plus sign. That'd be like the if keyword. That would be like the while keyword. That'd be like the for keyword, right? Here we have like the push keyword, right? We have the call keyword. So each one of those are going to have a, uh, a keyword but we also have to define a source value that we go ahead and bind to that keyword and sometimes a destination place to go ahead and push that as well. So we can see in this, this chart or this table is actually given to us inside of the book that shows us the different data types. So the types that we have in assembly are gonna be immediate register and memory. And so ultimately these are places in memory or a memory type that we tell the our, our assembly program on where to go to look up a value. Now, did you cover all of these types, these three types in uh, your assembly class? So like, so clearly you at least had to, to use two of these. Probably the common ones that you're familiar with are the register and the memory because the registers are those addressable spaces where our values are constantly getting pulled or pushed from, but you could also do memory lookups as well, right? Some, something that's not in register, you can actually do a lookup from outside of your register space and pull that from the memory of your application. So clearly that is a target, that it can be either a destination or it could be a source for one of these calls. If it's not in the register, you could try to load something from memory into a register. That's why that's important. 
be able to actually get things into the registers and to get them from the registers back into your memory so it can be saved for later lookup. We'll talk more about the immediate type in uh, the, the next slide or so. So just know that these are the equivalents of the different types that we have. And then we have our different operand values and then the names of our operands here. Okay, so we mentioned our registers here, which refers to the contents inside the CPU registers. We mentioned our memory references, which where we access our actually our memory from our computational, um, uh, from the computed addresses of where our data is reserved inside of our virtual addressing. And then finally, we have immediate and the immediate values are going to be used for our constant values. So if we have values, like the number three, for instance. That's not a value that exists inside of the register memory address. And it's not a value that exists inside of a memory address. That is an immediate value that it just gets looked up by the system. And so typically those are kind of uh, prefixed with a, uh, a dollar sign. Are those computationally Yes. Yes, yes. Those are, those are, since they're constant values, they're computationally cheaper. And in fact, uh, in fact, uh, the assembler itself will optimize the encoding size of those when those occur as well. So, and, and what that means is since those, when, when those get converted into the its immediate equivalent, if it was, uh, say for instance, declared as a, a, uh, a bigger byte sequence, it, it'll do a lookup on the much smaller size. Okay, let's talk about our memory uh, uh, address modes. So the general form for our, um, for being able to use these operands. So one of our operands was say, for instance, this first one, the operand value is IMM. Uh, Sure, sure for name for immediate, right? So let's say we wanted to go ahead and produce an immediate value. We want to see how that might work. So here we have our operand immediate and you see it has three parameters, which is your, uh, um, your base register, your index register, and it's gonna be some scale factor where scale factor is like one, two, four, eight. And our, actual um, operand is going to be the immediate offset. Then if I want to compute the effective address space of this, I can comp compute that as taking the sum of these values and then multiplying it by that uh, scale factor that I have. And of course, just the practical use case here is this is just the general form to see how we're referencing elements inside of memory. And so this is how we access like the array elements, for instance, how we can produce an offset so that we can jump based off of the encoding size from one segment of our memory to the next. Excellent. That's I think where I thought I would get today. And I'm getting pretty good at figuring out how many slides to make for a given. <laughs> For a given lecture, considering there's only two minutes left. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions about this chapter thus far? So we're on section, so we're on 3.4. And if I want to say this, so next class, then we're going to be jumping to, we'll look at um, arithmetic and logical operations, control procedures, and probably I'll try to get all the way up to maybe here to about 3.08 next lecture, and then we'll finish it off in, on, on uh, Tuesday, which means that I'll be able to go ahead and ideally open up the, uh, the next lab once we start by the end of next week then, just so that the labs can be open. Excellent, okay. Well, if there's no questions, I will see you all on Thursday. I have a question, Mr. Seth. Oh yeah, what what's that? Um, 
I wanted to see if I could still turn in my lab zero because I forgot to turn it in Friday.